You need to ask yourself, are you ready for the journey? Are you ready for the hard work? Are you ready to make sacrifices? Running a business can be tough, so it makes sense that managing your business accounts shouldn't get in the way of what you do best. But it's easy with Sage Accounting Tools on your smartphone, your tablet, or your laptop. It's accounting for wherever you are on your business journey. Go to sage.co.uk forward slash journey. Sage, accounting for the journey. Blog Talk Radio. Well, good morning. It's Blog Talk Radio, interpreters of the oracles of God. I hope everybody's doing awesome today on this beautiful Tuesday. I'm calling this one today, except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, excuse me. And it comes from Galatians 6.14. But, but may it never be that I would boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. And I, of course, want to say thank you to IHOP Kansas for letting me use their music. May the Lord bless them and keep them and make his face to shine upon them and give them peace. And I declare that they will have above and beyond what they could ever ask or even think or even imagine to fulfill their part of his story in Jesus' name. I'm going to declare Numbers 10-9. When you go to war in your land against the enemy that oppresses you, that you will blow an alarm with the trumpets, that you will be remembered before the Lord your God and be saved from every single one of your enemies. So I, of course, want to play the recording of the shofar. My prayer is going to be the word, of course. I'm going to start at Philippians 3.10. For our determined purpose is that we may know him, that we may progressively become more deeply and intimately acquainted with him, perceiving and recognizing and understanding the wonders of his person more strongly and more clearly, and that we may in the same way come to know the power outflowing from his resurrection, which it exerts over believers, and that we may so share his sufferings as to be continually transformed in spirit into his likeness, even to his death, in the hope that if possible, we may attain to the spiritual and moral resurrection that lifts us out from among the dead, even while in the body, not that we have attained this ideal or have already been made perfect, but we press on to lay hold of, to grasp, and make our own that for which Christ Jesus, the Messiah, has laid hold of us and made us his own. I do not consider, brethren, that I have captured and made it my own yet. But one thing I do, it is my one aspiration forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. I press on, I press on towards the goal to win the supreme and heavenly prize to which God in Christ Jesus is calling us upward. You know, the cross was a stumbling block to many and still is to many, still is to unbelievers because it's death to the carnal self to the world, to the flesh, and the devil. There's no self-righteousness or boasting, for the cross of Christ contains all of redemption. And, you know, it, it helps the world will lose its attraction to us, and we will lose our appetite for the world. They're dead to each other. Old things have passed away. Behold, believers have eyes to see the kingdom of God and ears to hear the King of Heaven, our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, think of what Paul said 
in 1 Corinthians 2.2. 2. He said, For I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. What is it about the cross? It's the remission of sins. Jesus died for the salvation of all men. And I want you to think about, this is from, it's called Nisbet's Church Pulpit Commentary on 1 Corinthians 2.2. 2. With St. Paul, everything else, but Jesus Christ and him crucified was a matter of secondary importance. And in this resolu- and in this resolution of his, we see a striking proof of the influence of the sufferings of Christ upon his first disciple disciples. It was not that Saint Paul despised learning or thought that thought there was not else worth worth, worth the knowing. He was an educated man, as education was understood in his ancient country, a student of Gamaliel. Versed in rabbinic lore, a soldier, a politician, a great traveler, familiar with the life and customs of the great portion of the civilized world, a philosopher and a poet. In becoming a Christian, he could not annihilate his manifold education or or the world of fact with which he had become acquainted. Christianity, whatever it does, does not place a premium upon ignorance or stupidity, but it is a mark of mental greatness and earnestness to single out matters of chief consequence from others less noteworthy and to concentrate attention on them. It was this that he meant. For in him the central object of divine revelation was the cross. And no more splendid homage could he have rendered it than this, that he should behave as if nothing else were worth thinking or speaking about. The Corinthians were vain in their spiritual gifts and their theosophies, and he sought to correct their aberrations and to humble them. It is thus the cross has still to thrust everything else into the background. It is the joy of the Christian's heart, the theme of his conversation, the glory of his life. The cross of Christ is of chief chief consequence in the reconciliation of sinners to God, and therefore it ought to receive the closest and most earnest attention. No, it's hard for many to understand that his death brought life. He bore our griefs, he carried our sorrows, He was separated from his father, so we wouldn't be eternally separated from him. He was afflicted for us, pierced for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. His wounds paid for our healing and our well-being fell upon him. You know, when I say Selah, you know, pause and think about that. And that's from Isaiah 53. Um, If you get a chance, please read all of Isaiah 53 because... 800 years before Jesus came, it spoke of his sufferings, that he was suffering for us. He's the one that paid the price. No man can work to pay the price to go to heaven. Jesus already did it for all of us, and it's us receiving it. And many stumble over the fact that they don't have to work because Jesus did the work. He finished it at the cross. And so I'm going to start at Isaiah 53. Verse 4, surely our griefs he himself bore and our sorrows he carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him and by his scourging. We are healed. You see, the stroke was due us. He was cut off for our transgressions. He laid down his life for us. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And as for his greatness, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living for the transgression of my people to whom the stroke was due as a result of the anguish of his soul? He will see it and be satisfied. 
By his knowledge, the righteous one, my servant, will justify the many, and he will bear their iniquities. He bore our iniquities. Therefore, I will allot him a portion with the great, and he will divide the booty with the strong, because he poured out himself to death. He poured himself out to death, okay? He willingly laid down his life for us because he was the only one with sinless blood because he had a supernatural birth so that he could come into this world with the sinless blood because of the transgression of Adam and that we could become like him. And it was I'm talking about him as in Jesus because he gave us a robe of righteousness. So we'll go back to that verse. And was numbered with the transgressors, yet he bore the sin of many and interceded for the transgressors. He poured himself out to death <clears throat> and bore the sin of many and interceded for the transgressors. Think about his birth. His birth was supernatural because his blood had to be sinless. Like I was saying before, we were born into Adam. And Jesus made it so we could have a supernatural birth also. He went ahead of us. He followed the law perfectly. He was baptized to fulfill all righteousness, to walk out the law. He came to fulfill it, not to abolish it. So we could then be clothed with his robe of righteousness. And I want you to think about David. You know, David, he needed mercy. And he understood redemption. He knew he was brought forth in iniquity. We're going to go in Psalm 51. We're going to start at verse 1. Be gracious to me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the greatness of your compassion. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Against you and you only I have sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you are justified when you speak and blameless when you judge. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. Behold, you desire truth in the innermost being, and in the hidden part you will make me know wisdom. Purify me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness. Let the bones which you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins. And blot out my iniquities. And I want you to think about in Isaiah. He said he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And by his wounds we were healed. In the next verse in Psalm 51.10. Create in me a clean heart, O God. And renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence. And do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and sustain me with a willing spirit. And I want you to think about, we talked about this a couple weeks ago in Ezekiel. The Lord said he was going to give a new heart and a new spirit. And the Holy Spirit is the one who helps us walk out, walk out our our walk with God. He says, then I will teach transgressors your way, ways and sinners will be converted to you. Deliver me from your blood guiltiness, O God, the God of my salvation. Then my tongue will joyfully sing of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, that my mouth may declare your praise. For you did not delight in sacrifice, otherwise I would give it. You are not pleased with burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. And I want you to think about that. In the New Testament, where it says that that those who are poor in spirit will inherit the kingdom. Well, what does that mean? That means that we know we can't do this on our own. We know we need a Savior. We know we need forgiveness of sins. And we, when we cry out to the Lord Jesus Christ, and we ask him to be Lord of our lives, and we confess our sins and truly, truly repent and turn from our sins, The Holy Spirit then comes in and makes our spirits alive. And then the Word of God helps us to renew our thinking. 
our old way of thinking. And so Jesus did the most beautiful and wonderful thing for us and laid down his life for us and took our sins, took our life so we could have his. It's so incredible. You know, and think of the cry of Paul's heart. We read part of it as part of our prayer, but the cry of Paul's heart in Philippians 3, and this is from the Amplified to progressively know Jesus, deeply, intimately acquainted with him. This is the cry of my heart, and I know it's the cry of your heart. So we're going to start in Philippians 3, 7 in the Amplified. But whatever former things I had that I might have been gains to me, I have come to consider as one combined loss for Christ's sake. Yet, yes, furthermore, I count everything as loss compared to the possession of the priceless privilege, the overwhelming preciousness, the surpassing worth, and supreme advantage of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, and of progressively becoming more deeply and intimately acquainted with him, of perceiving and recognizing and understanding him more fully and clearly. For his sake, I have lost everything and consider it all to be mere rubbish, refuse, dregs, in order that I may win and gain Christ, the anointed one, and that I may actually be found and known as in him, not having any self-achieved righteousness that can be called my own based on my obedience to the law's demands, ritualistic uprightness, and supposed right standing with God thus acquired, but possessing that genuine righteousness which comes through faith in Christ, the anointed one, the truly right standing with God, which comes by God from God by saving faith. For my determined purpose is that I may know him, that I may progressively become more deeply and intimately acquainted with him, perceiving and recognizing and understanding the wonders of his person more strongly and more clearly, and that I may in the same way come to know the power outflowing from his resurrection, which it exerts over believers, and that I may so share his sufferings as to be continually transformed in spirit into his likeness, even to his death in the hope that if possible, I may attain to the spiritual and moral resurrection that lifts me out from among the dead, even while in the body. That's hard to understand, isn't isn't it? You know what he's saying? Because we're seated in heavenly places and positionally, we're already seated in heavenly places. And if we're in heavenly places, with the Lord Jesus Christ, and that, and we know our where we're seated, and we know that we're co-heirs together. This resurrection is the power of the Lord Jesus Christ that flows from Him now can can flow to us and help us crucify the carnal nature. It's not physically crucifying a person. It's it's crucifying and putting to death the flesh, the carnal nature, and that the life of the Lord Jesus Christ by the power of the Spirit who begin to live in us as the Holy Spirit infuses into us progressively his life as we become sanctified, as we read the word of God, the Holy Spirit will use it, but it has to be illuminated by him. It just can't be just, just dead law. It has to be Rhema, or in other words, illumination from the Holy Spirit. I do not consider, brethren, that I have captured it and made it my own yet, but one thing I do is my one aspiration, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal to win the supreme and heavenly prize to which God in Christ Jesus is calling us upward. He has clothed us. Think about this. We're going to go into Isaiah 61.10. He has clothed us with salvation. 
He has wrapped us with a robe of righteousness. He did this at the cross. It's his work and his alone. You know, there's so many people, they think they have to work to get to him, but he came to us. He came to us through the cross. He says this in Isaiah 61:10. I will rejoice greatly in the Lord. My soul will exult in my God, for he has clothed me with garments of salvation. He has wrapped me with a robe of righteousness as a bridegroom decks himself with a garland and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. Your redemption happened at the cross. There's nothing you can do to work for it. It is by grace you have been saved and not by works, lest any man should boast. Because, see, he already prepared those works ahead of time for us to do. And when we follow the path that he set out to do and do the works that he already set for us to do, those are the works that are going to survive uh, survive when we are before him. I want you to think about this also. Knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver and gold from your futile way of life inherited from your forefathers. That is in 1 Peter 1.18. We're going to read a little bit of it because I believe it was last week or the week before we talked about DNA. And we talked about how there's uh, only a small part of our DNA is used because we can recreate with the word of God. Because the DNA shows there's a God right there. Everything about both sides of our family are in that DNA right down to our eye color. It's so incredible. And we talked about laminin and how it's in the shape of a cross. And how it's intertwined around the cross and how the scriptures talk about how Jesus holds everything together. It's so incredible. So it says, but with the precious blood as of a lamb, unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. For he was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but has appeared in these last times for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. Since you have, in obedience to the truth, purified your souls for a sincere love of the brethren, fervently love one another from the heart. For you have been born again, not of seed which is perishable, but imperishable. That is, through the living and enduring word of God. And and how does one have that spiritual birth, they ask Jesus to come into their hearts and forgive their sins. And truly, truly you have to be repentant. And when you really turn, you turn your, your, your you, you do a 180 turn. That's what it means to turn from your sin with the help of Jesus, by the power of the Spirit. We don't have to do any of this alone, but if you truly repent, there is only one sin that he will not forgive, and that's it. that's if you do not receive him. And the other one is blaspheming the Holy Spirit, which I believe is a person not receiving him, or saying that the works of God are from the works of the devil, and I see that every day. And so surrender your life. He loves you. He loves you. He did all this for you and for me. Think of what his mission was in Isaiah 61, the whole... The whole chapter is amazing, but I'm going to read the first couple verses. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, and this came to pass in Luke 4. This is Isaiah 61 coming to pass in Luke 4. Because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the afflicted. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to captives and freedom to prisoners, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all who mourn, to grant those who mourn in Zion, giving them a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of a spirit of fainting. So they will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. He did it at the cross. And remember last week we talked about the legal victory 
at the cross, and that is in Colossians 2. And we're going to start at verse 9. For in him all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form, and in him you have been made complete. And he is the head over all rule and authority. And in him you were also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands in the removal of the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised up with him through faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. When you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with him, having forgiven us all our transgressions, having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us, which was hostile to us. And he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. When he had disarmed the rulers and authorities, he made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through him. And if you're going, huh? because you didn't get that, I'm going to read that in the New Living also. So here it goes. We're going to start at verse 8 in the New Living Translation. Don't let anyone lead you astray with empty philosophy and high-sounding nonsense that comes from human thinking and from the evil powers of this world and not from Christ. For in Christ, the fullness of God lives in a human body. And you are complete through your union with Christ. He is the Lord over every ruler and authority in the universe. When you came to Christ, you were circumcised, but not by a physical procedure. It was a spiritual procedure, the cutting away of your sinful nature. For you were buried with Christ when you were baptized. And with him, you were raised to a new life because you trusted the mighty power of God who raised Christ from the dead. You were dead because of your sins and because of your sinful, and because your sinful nature was not yet cut away. Then God made you alive with Christ. He forgave all our sins. He canceled the record that contained the charges against us. He took it and destroyed it. By nailing it to the cross, in this way, God disarmed the evil rulers and authorities. He shamed them publicly by his victory over them on the cross of Christ. Isn't that so beautiful? Jesus did that for us. He did it for us. It's so amazing. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to play, uh, I'm going to stop and play a little bit of this song. I won't get through it. It's a long song. So we're going to play a little bit of You Set Your Love on Me by Misty Edwards.
beautiful. He shed his love on us. That's what he did at the cross. That's what he did when he came out from heaven, when he had a supernatural birth. He had a supernatural birth because he has the only sinless blood. And he came to redeem us from Adam's transgression. I want you to think about this in Hebrews 9.11. But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things to come, he entered through the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this creation, and not through the blood of goats and calves, but through his own blood. He entered the holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. How much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? For this reason, he is the mediator of a new covenant, so that since a death has taken place for the redemption of the transgressions that were committed under the first covenant, those who have been called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. I want you to go to Hebrews 9.24. For Christ did not enter a holy place made with hands, a mere copy of the true one, but into heaven itself now, to appear in the presence of God for us. Nor was it that he would offer himself often, as the high priest enters the holy place year by year with blood that is not his own. Otherwise, he would have needed to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now, once at the consummation of the ages, he has been manifested to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And inasmuch as it is appointed for men to die once, after this comes judgment, so Christ also, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time for salvation without reference to sin to those who eagerly await him. And I want to read in Ephesians our beautiful, beautiful inherit some of it. There's so much more. But I'm going to read this in the New Living. Ephesians, starting at Ephesians 1, I'm going to do verses 4 through 14 in the New Living. How we praise God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realm because we belong to Christ. Long ago, even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. His unchanging plan has always been to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. And this gave him great pleasure. So we praise God for the wonderful kindness he has poured out on us because we belong to his dearly loved son. He is so rich in kindness that he purchased our freedom through the blood of his son and our sins are forgiven. He has showered his kindness on us along with all wisdom and understanding. That secret plan has now been revealed to us. It is a plan centered on Christ designed long ago according to his good pleasure. And this is his plan. At the right time, he will bring everything together under the authority of Christ, everything in heaven and on earth. Furthermore, because of Christ, we have received an inheritance from God, for he chose us from the beginning. And all things happen just as he decided long ago. God's purpose was that we who were first to trust in Christ should praise our glorious Father. And now you also have heard the truth, the good news that God saved you. And when you believed in Christ, he identified you as his own by giving you the Holy Spirit, whom he promised long ago. The Spirit is God's guarantee that he will give us everything he promised and that he has purchased us to be his own people. This is just one more reason for us to praise our glorious God. And I'm going to I'm going to end with uh with uh, 
Romans 6 also in the New Living. You can read these in the New King. You can read them in the King James. You can read it in the Message. Read all of it, and you'll, you'll get such illumination when you study out of all these different versions. Listen to what this says. It's so beautiful. Romans 6, starting at verse 1. Sin's power is broken. Well then, should we keep on sinning so that God can show us more and more kindness and forgiveness? Of course not. Since we, since we have died to sin, how can we continue to live in it? Or have you forgotten that when we became Christians and were baptized to become one with Christ Jesus, we died with him. For we died and were buried with Christ by baptism. And just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, now we also may live new life. Since we have been united with him in his death, we will also be raised as he was. Our old sinful selves were crucified with Christ so that sin might lose its power in our lives. We are no longer slaves to sin. For when we died with Christ, we were set free from the power of sin. And since we died with Christ, we know we will also share his new life. In other words, we died to our old life. Because Jesus then put his life inside of us. We are sure of this because Christ rose from the dead. And he will never die again. Death no longer has any power over him. He died once to defeat sin, and now he lives for the glory of God. So you should consider yourself dead to sin and able to live for the glory of God through Christ Jesus. Do not let sin control the way you live. Do not give in to its lustful desires. Do not let any part of your body become a tool of wickedness to be used for sinning. Instead, give yourselves completely to God since you have been given new life and use your whole body as a tool. Do what is right for the glory of God. Sin is no longer your master for you are no longer subject to the law which enslaves you to sin. Instead, you are free by God's grace. Isn't that powerful? Isn't that powerful? And for those who like the older versions, I'm going to do it in the Dewey Reigns, which says this. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. For we that are dead sin, how shall we live any longer therein? Know you not that all we who were baptized in Christ Jesus are baptized in his death? For we are buried together with him by baptism in death, that as Christ is risen from the dead and the glory of the Father, so we also may walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin may be destroyed to the end that we may serve sin no longer. For he that is dead is justified from sin. Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also that we shall live also together with Christ, knowing that Christ rise, rising again from the dead dieth now no more. Death shall no more have dominion over him. For in that he died to sin, he died once. But in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. So do you also reckon that you are dead to sin, but alive unto God, in Christ Jesus our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, so as to obey the lusts thereof. Neither, neither yield ye your members as instruments of iniquity unto sin, but present yourselves to God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of justice unto God. And so, of course I'm running out of time. And I want to play a little bit of a song from Misty Edwards and Lauren Holmes from IHOP called Let Your Love Flow. Thank you for joining me. See you next week. Please listen to the song. It's really beautiful. 